So today we are looking at Kit 1 Theme I, which is called Homophones 1. And the reason why it's called Homophones 1 is there's a Homophones 2 later, as well as a Homophones 3. And I was just saying that Melvin takes some ideas through this real spelling work, and he lays the foundation, and then each theme sort of adds something to it, but it's not a gigantic leap in cognitive work, um, which I appreciate. So some of this you'll say, yes, I know that, and some of it will reinforce things you've already taught. Other bits of this theme might be new, but in general, it's good practice for kids, especially when you think about a gradual release of responsibility. So this theme, the big ideas of this theme are that the homophone principle is, a fun, is fundamental to the spelling system. Words which have the same pronunciation but different meanings will, if possible, have different spelling. He doesn't, in the real spelling system, there's not a ton of rules and things for kids to memorize. But this is an idea that you want to get in your head as you approach words. Um, and I was talking about this at dinner last night. Oral language preceded written language. So what happened was when those guys sat down to figure out spellings, when they already had two words that were used to differentiate between things by meaning, but they, it sounded the same, they consciously tried to make sure there was a spelling shift so that you could tell them apart by meaning. It doesn't always work, but it often works. And this theme talks about that. So it, it isn't that homophones are there to make us crazy. There's actually a reason why they're spelled differently, and often those reasons are connected either to structure or meaning. And that's what the theme deals with. Working with homophones reinforces several aspects of real spelling. Having different ways of representing the same speech sound is an advantage of the spelling system. Um, there are people that wish that we could you know, trash the spelling system we have and come up with new letters to make it all simple, but it's just not going to work. The actual system we have, it does work. You just have to know how to look at it. Mm -hmm. Consciously distinguishing homophones can reinforce knowledge of real word structure. So when kids learn how to look at homophones and dig slightly deeper to say, okay, why is that one spelled this way? It links them to other meanings and other spellings. Working with homophones highlights the real phonology of the spelling system. So things do sound the same, but their meaning is more important than the way something sounds. So basically, homophone study gives real opportunities for learning about the English spelling system. That's why it comes off so often in the kit. And if there is ever a day ha -ha, that you think, I have nothing to do with my children, <laughs> looking at homophones, sending them on homophone hunts, or anything you can do with homophones, it is representative of all the work that we're trying to do. It's a really good place to start. Okay, so <clears throat> the background, excuse me, for this theme, one of the reasons why we were looking at the digraphs, what, at the different graphemes for the vowel letters is because when you have two homophones, often what is different about them is the vowel. So the shift in the vowel, and we know that some vowels, some graphemes can come initial, medial, or final, the people that sat down and, and figured out how to differentiate the homophones so we knew they meant something different used this to help determine which vowel would be used. Okay, so for example, here and here, H-E-E, H-E-R-E, -E, and H-E-A-R, they picked E-A, I don't know which one came first, but they, they picked E-A out of a group of pickings they could use, but there was a reason why they did it, and it was because H-E-A-R is linked to E-A-R, which they already had for ear. So finding those connections make the system just suddenly make sense, okay? So the work we've done with this, although this might not be secure with our students, it's fine. But this was why we started with that before we got into something like this, was to give them places to go and things to recognize, okay? Um, so. One of the ways to introduce this theme, Melvin says, and I've quoted him here, is the English spelling system is very clever. Remember the most important job that spelling does, the way we spell a word is a way of showing us what the word means. Meaning is our, is our top idea when we're talking about spelling. We use words to represent meaning. So when we spell a word a certain way, it links things to meaning. If two words, this is the principle, that have different meanings or pronounced the same, then we usually have different ways of writing the pronunciation so that we have a different spelling for each meaning. A different meaning equals a different spelling, even if the words have the same pronunciation. Of course, where possible. Doesn't always happen, but I think it's rare. Words that are pronounced the same as each other but have different meanings are called homophones. English is rich in homophones, which is another reason why this is a really good study for kids, because there's lots and lots of homophones. Excuse me, we're going to look at just a few of them. 
um, in this theme today. So one of the things that I also started thinking about was we've talked about meaning being the top tier, the main thing that we're going for with spelling. And when kids are stuck on a spelling, the questions they need to ask themselves are what does it mean, how is it built, what are its relatives, and what sounds matter. And I'm wondering if inserted in there somewhere isn't also the idea, are there any homophones? Because if you think about that, they are very frequent and figure out what the other word would be. Maybe A, you know that spelling, and so it'll clue you into the spelling you're missing. Or just knowing there's another one will help you kind of see it in your mind. So I've added this in a little bit as a question for Melvin, but also something I'm thinking about, okay? So in the theme, he gets into how do you tell homophones apart? Um, there's often, but not necessarily always, a way of telling which homophone is which. It can be done one of two ways, using etymology, what, what words with connected meanings do we know, like H-E-A-R and E-A-R, they're connected and they go together, or using morphology, what's the structure of the word. And an example of that one would be, like this one, well this is also meaning, often it's double, structure of the word would be H-E-R-E, -E, is connected structurally and by meaning with T-H-E-R-E. -E. They're both places, locales, mm -hmm. although they're not homophones, that's a structural connection, okay? So these are some homophones that our students probably know and we've definitely worked with. Here's the one with H-E-A-R and H-E-R-E. -E. We have M-E-E-T and M-E-A-T, and the connection there that kids will pick out very quickly was E-A-T, yep. We have the three, T-O, T-O-O, and T-W-O. This is a theme we studied earlier in the year that helps us with the T-W as being connected to twin, twice, and twelve. The TW often indicates two, okay? So getting them to think about homophones they know, this theme is asking them to look and try to make some connections. The connections they make won't always be right, but that's not the point. The point is, is we as learners understand this, that spelling is a system that we can figure out, that has answers if you don't take it at surface, but you try to go underneath it. Okay, so the question to ask is, if these words are pronounced the same way, same, why do they have different spellings? And it's because if words have different meanings, then they will have different spellings if it's possible. You can introduce the homophones first and get kids led here, or you can lead off with this and get some examples from them. Okay, the other thing that I've been thinking about is was, as we go to assess spelling, which we're going to be working on a little bit more next year, getting some clear assessments. Um, an assessment to me is not matching homophones or figuring out what the homophone is. It's this kind of big idea. Why does this happen? And knowing that about the system, system-wide assessments rather than word-limiting assessments. Because if we understand a system, we can apply it to many, many words. Okay. So, then moving on. This is a worked example that you could show kids. This is how I might examine the S-I-G-H family and its homophones. I would discuss the spelling S-I-G-H, which is excellent because we just did I-G-H also. So telling kids that I-G-H is a perfectly normal selection to represent the long I sound. We know that, I don't have I up here, but we've already looked at some of those and we know it's quite common, shouldn't throw anybody off. This is consonant letter plus I-G-H makes the I sound. You can build a word web, just attaching some basic uh, pref prefixes suffixes, um, side, size, sighing, and sire, then identify the two members of the family that have homophones, size, side, those have homophones, I, I should be spelling them out so you know which ones are which, but time taking. There's an unlikely one here, which kids probably don't know, S-I-R-E, they probably don't know that, maybe the upper grades will, but it, this actually has three homophones in it. And then how can you prove which is which? Showing kids how you do it or sending them off on this task, and this is how Melvin shows us. S-I-G-H-S and S-I-Z-E. S-I-G-H plus S gives you this word. So really, the base is not a homophone. It's only a homophone when the suffix is added, and kids can break that apart. S-I-Z-E is a base word by itself. We've talked about this a little bit. What I like is if you've already done some of this work, it's an excellent opportunity to reinforce it and get more practice. Same thing here, the ED for S-I-G-H-E-D indicates that it is, the base word is not the homophone, it's the addition of the suffix that does it. S-I-D-E is a base word by itself, okay? So this is a, um, they're kind of having to look at the structure of the word in order to identify the homophones. 
But if they know already, S-I-G-H plus E-D is the way you spell that word, and they're confident in taking off affixes, then this isn't going to be hard to do. And eventually, it'll become like mental math. They'll be able to do it in their heads. Um, there's other words that you could practice with using consonant letter plus I-G-H, and this may be where the lower grades want to stop because what I'm about to do gets much deeper, but this would be worth a lot of time spent, especially if you just looked at IGH and they're having some confidence with that as a trigraph, okay? Then he work, moves on into looking at homophones specifically with the long E graphemes and the long A graphemes, and this goes back to why we spent time looking at these anyway, because they come up, homophones do. So this looks crazy, but this was my kind of mind map of this. Um, in the theme, Melvin gives us these words, and then he gives you notes for the teacher as to cueing you as to why they are, you can, how you can tell which homophone is which, okay? So I wrote these down. He doesn't give the, it for all of them, um, but if you wanted to introduce this to your kids, you could start with the list and walk them through, coach them on some of the ways you noticed, and then turn them loose on figuring it out, them out themselves, okay? I'll go through them really quickly. S-E-E -E and S-E-A. S-E-E -E and S-E-E-N are connected, both meaning and structurally. So that's why the E-E digraph, that's how it goes. That's the, and I don't know how to say this in words, but that's where you want to put S-E-E -E in your mind connected to S-E-E-N. So if I'm getting ready to write it, I'm saying, what am I trying to mean with this word? And connect it in meaning to another to help me spell it. The other thing that Farah told me last year, and I didn't see it in the theme, but I love, is S-E-A has an E-A just like ocean does. That's a great link. Whether or not it's true, I, I don't know, and I don't know if any of this is, Melvin would say is true, but this is one that a kid might come up with, and maybe they did in their class, and it's brilliant. D-E-A-R and D-E-E-R. D-E-A-R is connected to darling, which means little deer. So if you go into your dictionary and look up darling, that's exactly what it says it's called. So again, in meaning. Would kids know this right off? No, but it's the investigation that we're working on, not necessarily knowing all this. Um, B-E-E-N and B-E-A-N, this one's interesting. B-E plus E-N gives you B-E-B-E-E-N, and this helps to know because the single silent E at the end of B-E isn't really a single silent E at all. It's part of the base, and so it wouldn't drop <coughs> off. So this is one that kids would have fun playing with, and E-N is a suffix I don't have up on my chart, so it would be an excellent opportunity to add. Um, R-E-A-D can also be pronounced in the past tense with a short vowel sound, so read or read, and only E-A can make that possible. E-A is a grapheme that can do both of those things, but another choice, if they would have selected something else, we wouldn't have had that option, for a word that already existed orally. Amazing, right? <laughs> and one of my favorites, and I did this one at dinner last night, H-E-A-L and H-E-E-L. H-E-A-L is connected to the word help in meaning, and so if you know that, then it can help you determine which homophone you're trying to write with, okay? Again, it can only do that with an E-A digraph. So, I'm not going to walk through all of these reasons as well, but he's given you so much investigative material in this theme and how you determine to pitch it to your kids. Um, one way might be to walk them through a couple and then send them loose. Another way for the older kids might be just to send them loose and find out what they come up with. Um, and then after you get through with E and A homophones, he also gives other sets of homophones just to investigate. I've put all of these up on the server in photographs so you can see them, but it's not, you know, you don't need me to read them all out to you. Um, finally though, the idea that we want to come get across to our kids is homophone, understanding of homophones in the English spelling system is a powerful thing for us as spellers. Not only is it fun to find these and to hypothesize as to those links, it uses real spelling ideas we've already taught. Graphemes, suffixes, prefixes, meaning and structure. It provides an opportunity for students to hypothesize and prove their own thinking, which means they're not just like you're sitting here receiving all of my words, they're actually having to do the work, which even if they're wrong, means their, their cognitive load has increased. 
And it isn't about isolated spellings, it is about the critical thinking. So our examination of whether or not kids are doing well with this wouldn't be spelling the two homophones for maid. I mean, it would be, mm -hmm. how might you go about this? Tell me what your thinking is around determining which one to use. And if a little person says, I need to think about what I mean when I'm about to write it, and then connect it to other words that might be built that way, we've just hit the jackpot. Okay? So that's the theme. And I love homophones. <laughs> I remember I asked